and everybody else. Um, and I'll just give the brief introduction that we've seen more and more facilities uh, being asked to use urine PCR testing instead of UAs, and, which is why we have started uh, or why we set aside this meeting because it's a terribly important question. And I'm just going to turn it over to you, Singh. Uh, take it away. Sure. Thank you. Thanks for bringing up this topic for Journal Club. I'm repurposing some slides that I put together last summer for the PALTC Knowledge Network at the University of Colorado. Um, it's a group of people getting together, both from the academic and community side, to talk about issues in long-term care. So I had the chance to talk about how we diagnose UTIs from the community physician standpoint and bring up this idea of what do we do with the urine PCRs that we're seeing in our facilities. And so I'm gonna give the introduction today and we'll move on to Dr. Fitzpatrick and Beely. But just as a reminder, we know how to diagnose UTIs, right? We have tools that come from CDPHE, like the one on the left, we have this wonderful diagnosis worksheet from Greg Gom, and this gives us clinical criteria for when we should be thinking about doing a urine test, when we should be thinking about starting empiric antibiotics for UTIs. And I would highly encourage anyone who's not already using a tool like this to use that, um, not only to keep ourselves in check so we're only ordering urine tests when we need to, but also when we're having conversations with our facility staff members and the family members that we work with to show them that this is the decision-making we're using. When we're asked to check, can you please check my mom for a UTI? This is exactly what she looks like when she has a UTI. Let's show them the decision-making that we're using to try to get um, a diagnosis. If you don't have these tools, they're easy to find. The CDPHE has it right up on their website for the antimicrobial stewardship. And then Dr. Gom sends his out to everyone and I'm happy to send them to you too. We know that diagnosing UTI starts with the worksheets that I just showed you. It's a clinical symptoms and sign and the lab studies help us confirm the diagnosis. And the article that Dr. Gom sent out from the diagnostics journal has a very great comprehensive review of all the available lab studies that we can use to check for infections in the urinary tract. And that article plus everything else I've read says that urine culture remains the gold standard lab study for UTIs. Sing, uh -huh. uh, interrupt. We are just seeing uh, your screen, at least what I see, it just says Zoom. Oh. I, I don't think we're seeing your screen. Uh. Well, that's kind of boring. Yeah. Is this? Travis, if, there we go. Here? Now we got it. There you go. Okay. Well, then you didn't see this slide that I was trying to show off, especially the one on the right written by Greg. So these are the tools that we will use to diagnose UTIs. If you don't have one of these tools or are not using one, please reach out and we can make sure that you and your teams are using them. And all of these tools, the conclusion is if you think you suspect a UTI, check your analysis and culture. Right? So our urinalysis and culture still remains the gold standard lab study. The journal article that was sent out confirms this. Every society that has guidelines about urinary tract infections, CDC, Infectious Disease Society, AMDA, they're all saying, yes, gold standard is still the urinary culture. We know that it can take some time to get these lab results. A UA often will take one or two days, culture three to five days, if not longer. It does take a clean catch urine sample collection in order to do the test, but it is still the gold standard. It is backed up by decades of research and every clinician has been taught the threshold. If you have greater than 10 to the fifth colony forming units, then that is your threshold for diagnosing a UTI. The lab, from, the, from the laboratory standpoint, ultimate diagnosis is made by the clinical bedside assessment. I'm glad you can see my slides now. This is, <laughs> so yes, just as Greg mentioned, we are seeing PCR being used instead of cultures. And on the right, you can see just an example of a lab requisition form. At the bottom, 
um, is where the lab was requested. In this case, which happened just a couple of months ago, the nurse practitioner ordered urine culture for a patient suspected of having a UTI. And the nurse came over here and I, I interpret that as checking the box that says UA with a, a culture. Um, what in fact happened was the lab returned a report that was performed with the urine on PCR instead. And that's how it came to my attention. Like, what do I do with this test? And I ordered a culture. I'm not sure why I got a PCR. The PCR is being promoted as being easier. All you have to do, all you have to do in quotation marks is swab the person instead of catching a cup of urine. It's being promoted as being quicker. You can often get a PCR report within hours. Sometimes they are even integrating right into our electronic medical records. And it is considered more sensitive. It's highly sensitive. You will never miss an organism in that urine sample. But along with that means that the PCR is going to detect more non-infectious organisms. Studies show that there will be more polymicrobial results compared to urine cultures. And we don't know the correlation with PCR with UA. Like we, we have protocols for if you check a urinalysis, when that will reflex to a culture. Well, when do you reflex a UA to a PCR? We don't have data yet to tell us how that would happen. And same thing with our clinical symptoms and signs. The McGeer criteria, the low criteria, the worksheets that you just saw from CDPHE and Dr. Gom, those are all built based on the known sensitivity and specificity for urine cultures based on our pretest probability, which signs and symptoms tell us when to get a urine test. And we don't have that data for PCR and certainly not in long-term care facilities. Um, PCR is not FDA approved for assessing for a UTI, and which means that there's no standard in how the reports are done or which specific PCR tests are being done on our patients. And finally, one thing that really I'm still trying to grasp my head around, but when we get susceptibility testing from a culture, that means that in the Petri dish, someone has tested each of those specimens for susceptibility to antimicrobials. Um, PCR is picking up on pieces of DNA and telling us which markers are present. And Dr. Chaya with the CDPHE has taught me that genotype does not equal phenotype. And just referring to a genomic library may not actually tell us which antibiotics to use. Most, if not all, of the clinicians that I've talked to do not agree with this practice. And I can tell you for sure from the payer side of things that PCR is much more expensive compared to culture, um, but there are many, many clinical reasons that we should be concerned about this test. So that's my um, take from the clinical side. And today we have two very special speakers that are going to talk from their respective expertise. Um, Dr. Meg Fitzpatrick, infectious disease physician at the University of Colorado, and Dr. Lauren Beely, the pharmacy uh, antimicrobial steward, it's a big title, stewardship lead at the CDPHE. So um, Dr. Fitzpatrick, can we start with you? Yes, yeah, thanks, Singh. Let me see if I can share my slides. I will tell you, I struggle uh, with this sometimes too, getting this right. <laughs> um, let's see here. All right, are you guys seeing slides okay? I don't see them yet. Oh dear, hang on. I, I do have your slides, Meg, if you need me to do it too. So just let me know. <laughs> I think I just uh, have the slides displaying on the wrong screen. <clears throat> okay. Which is always a problem. Would you like me to share them? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Here, let me stop sharing and then maybe you can do it. Oh, yeah, I don't know why I didn't see it. Well, obviously I had trouble with it at first too, so. Yeah. Okay, perfect. 
Thank you, Singh. I have two sure. screens going and wasn't able to sort it out. Um, <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, so I I was on the same um, talk for the Post-Acute Long-Term Care Knowledge Network with Singh, and we were able to um, present this data. And so I'm going to build a little bit off of what Singh has already presented in terms of molecular diagnostics in UTI. Um, so I am an uh, infectious diseases physician at the University of Colorado, and I do a lot of research work on urinary tract infections, particularly in rehab and long-term care populations. Um, next slide, Singh. Thank you. Uh, so um, I'm not going to go too much into this. Um, I do think Lauren is going to touch on this a little bit more when she talks about diagnostic stewardship, but an important uh, thing to understand when we frame the conversation about urine testing for UTIs, especially in post-acute long-term care settings, is this idea behind do we even need to send a urine test in the first place, right? So UTIs are certainly very common causes of bacterial infections, and we need to be very thorough in our assessment for them. But it's really, really important to start with the decision of, do you even need any urine test in the first place before you even think about which type of urine test you want to send, right? Because we know that many, many people have microorganisms in their urine often, um, and they don't have urinary tract infections. So asymptomatic bacteria is very common, and it's especially common in patient populations that um, reside in post-acute long-term care settings. Um, so patients who use urinary catheters up to almost 100% of the time are going to, you're going to identify white blood cells and bacteria in the urine, whether or not a urinary tract infection is present. Um, so that's where this graphic from the CDC, which I really love, just strongly emphasizes kind of a mindful pause before you send any urine test in the first place, um, right, about really being thoughtful and assessing are the signs and symptoms present. And I love the tools that Singh shared, because those are the resources and the bedside tools that you use to make that first decision in the first place so that you don't have to worry about, okay, what kind of test do I need to send? And then how do I interpret these 18 different bacteria that resulted from this test? Because you've already done the thinking up front, right? About whether that patient is likely to have a UTI or not. Um, so if you, if you, you know, feel like you need to send a urine test because a patient does have um, signs and symptoms that could possibly suggest a UTI, then it comes to what test should we send, right? And as Singh mentioned, certainly urine culture, urine analysis and urine culture is the standard of care and remains that way for good reasons right now. Um, but I will say there are limitations to that technology, right? So conventional urine culture, some studies have reported anywhere from 50 to 80% sensitivity um, in detecting um, uropathogens, typical pathogenic bacteria, and people with acute uncomplicated UTI. We don't really have much data for people with complicated UTI or catheter-associated UTI. And part of the issues with this is that traditional urine culture techniques really select for certain types of bacteria, aerobic bacteria, fast-growing bacteria, but these are overwhelmingly the most common bacteria that do cause urinary tract infection. Um, but there are some limitations there, and so I'm not surprised that um, some people have started to investigate alternate technologies for um, identifying microorganisms in the urine. Mm -hmm. Next slide, Singh, thank you. So I wanted to go a little bit more into this technology and describe it a little bit more for you and present the data that we have, um, which comes, uh, this, this data is largely from a, a large systematic review and meta-analysis that was published um, about a year and a half ago, um, reviewing kind of all of the research studies that were done investigating um, molecular tests to identify urine microorganisms. So as Singh mentioned, um, culture independent techniques or molecular tests really rely primarily on detecting microorganism DNA in the urine. Um, and there's two different ways to do that. Next generation sequencing would be taking a urine sample and I want to emphasize that all of the studies done on this were from actual urine. Uh, no, nobody's looked at doing this from like a swab of the urethra, which is just crazy to me, but um, from actual urine, taking a sample from actual urine and, um, you know, removing all the human DNA and taking what's left and then sequencing all of it, basically, and comparing those sequences of DNA to a, to a known database of DNA of microorganisms. And so basically identifying every single microorganism in the urine that we know of. Um, and then there's another technique, which is much more targeted, not as sort of shotgun, and that's PCR, basically. So coming up with a list of bacteria you are interested in looking for, and then um, taking a urine sample, and again, taking out the human DNA, and then what you're left with, 
you basically look for those organisms using dedicated PCR primers. So you're only looking for sort of a set list of bacteria that you're interested in finding. So PCR gives you um, a more limited range of organisms in the urine, but could be a little bit more targeted. Um, so this is data from this meta-analysis. They basically looked at um, seven studies that compared next generation sequencing to traditional urine culture. And then they also included six studies that compared PCR to traditional urine culture. Now it's important to know, and the authors of this systematic review emphasized that these studies were very heterogeneous. They used different protocols. They used different equipment to do the next generation sequencing or the PCR. For the studies that used PCR, they each one had different lists of organisms they looked for. Um, they had different sort of standards and thresholds that they considered for the amount of DNA that had to be present to consider it to be a positive result. So there was really um, a lot of bias that could have been introduced in a lot of these studies, but this is the best data that we have so far. So when they looked at the results for studies that compared sequencing, next generation sequencing to culture, um, certainly as Singh mentioned, sequencing identified more organisms overall than the cultures did. So 78% of culture negative urine samples had at least one organism identified by next generation sequencing. And the species diversity was greater. So a, a greater uh, variety of microorganisms was detected by the sequencing. And that's what the figure is showing you. So you can see organisms only detected by sequencing were some unusual things, anaerobes, shigella, salmonella, things that we don't traditionally think of causing UTIs. Um, the typical organisms were detected by culture, um, and especially a lot of the organisms like E. coli, Enterococcus, and Klebsiella, basically the, the big three, the top three, were detected by both. Um, what was interesting to me is 82% of culture positive urine samples were positive by sequencing, which still meant that a fair bit of them were negative by sequencing, which is strange to me um, and maybe speaks to some of the, the limitations there. Um, and then the PCR studies, when they looked at the PCR studies, PCR was more sensitive, but in half of the studies, PCR was positive basically as often as culture was. So only half of the studies showed that PCR was more sensitive in detecting more organisms. And then again, with PCR testing, this was a more limited list of organisms they were looking for. Um, but there were uh, there was an organism, for instance, urea plasma urea lyticum. So that's a bacteria we cannot culture very well in the lab. Most labs can't grow it. Um, so that one was detected with PCR. But almost all the regular uh, bacteria we would we would be concerned about were detected with both culture and PCR. Um, so I think this really speaks to the fact that this is an emerging technology. As of right now, it's not definitively better than urine culture, but it probably is more sensitive in detecting microorganisms. Um, next slide, Singh. So what, what does that mean though? And so I wanted to highlight some of the limitations and caveats. I'll go through this quickly because I think Singh really did a great job of highlighting a lot of this already. One of the studies in this systematic review um, actually tested urine samples from completely asymptomatic, healthy adult patients. And 95% of those people had positive molecular tests and compared to 23% who had positive urine cultures. So that is a, is a huge problem. There is very poor specificity to this test. Um, and that's probably because we're detecting a lot of colonizing bacteria, commensal bacteria that are not pathogenic. Molecular tests also can identify DNA from dead bacteria, things like that. There wasn't much standardization. Singh highlighted we don't have FDA or Clinical Laboratory Standards Institute's validation. There's different protocols being used. Quality control is an issue, particularly with sample collection, as Singh highlighted. Um, and really no standardized algorithms, as she mentioned, to predict, well, which if you get, if you get a result with 10 organisms on it, not all of them are pathogens, which ones are the ones that we need to be worried about? And that's where the lack of clinical data comes in. We don't know that using these tests actually means better outcomes for patients, that patients get diagnosed more appropriately or that they get antibiotics more appropriately. And I have a lot of concerns about the antibiotic susceptibility testing. Um, so Singh, if you wanna go to the last slide, we can look at this. Um, I'm trying to find my cursor. Oh, I know, I know. I lost my cursor too when I was trying to, there we go, perfect. So this is a sample result. Um, so this is from a company called Pathognostics. I have no idea if this is a company that some of the, the post-acute long-term care facilities are using, but this is one online that's got a pretty big presence. And they um, publish, this is freely available online, they publish 
samples of what their reports look like for their molecular urine tests. So here's an example of a report where they detected four different bacteria. And one thing that's concerning is obviously these variable amounts of bacteria here. So some of these bacteria are present in very small quantities, but they're using the genetics, um, the, the sequencing or the PCR to identify antibiotic resistance genes based on the DNA. Um, and then they're using that to predict which antibiotics they say will work against these organisms. And there's a huge problem with this because if you don't know what's pathogenic in the first place, you don't really need to use an antibiotic for those things if they're not pathogenic. And so these reports, I think, could be very misleading. As a provider, you would look at this and say, oh, I'm just going to pick the antibiotic that has all the check marks, right? Mm -hmm. and, and an example would be tetracycline in the first column. But you know what? Tetracycline is a terrible antibiotic for urinary tract infections. It's not a first-line recommended antibiotic. So reports like this are very misleading. And we really don't know how these predicted antibiotic susceptibilities based on the genotype actually correlate to clinical treatment. Um, so uh, I think this is, in conclusion, I think this is a very exciting technology. I want to see it studied more, and I want to see protocols and validation and clinical data, and then I think it could become really, really useful, but it's just not ready for prime time. Thank you. There's a question in the chat box. I mean, is there an amplification step in NGS? Um, typically, there is. I will say I don't do, I don't do that, um, uh, but typically there is. Um, typically what you're doing is taking basically, uh, taking all the bacterial DNA or maybe it's fungal DNA, whatever's in the urine, essentially, um, extracting the DNA out of the cells of the organisms, getting rid of everything else, breaking up the DNA into pieces, amplifying it, and then sequencing it. That's kind of usually how it goes. Although I'm by no means an expert in this technology. <laughs> Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Lauren Beely. Um, I don't know if you're going to be addressing that question from Travis Neal in the chat box. or if you Yeah, wanna, I saw that you know. one. <clears throat> um, I'll just take literally a minute or two because I know I want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions. Um, but I'm Lauren Beely, um, as she mentioned, and um, I think the important thing that I want to talk about today is diagnostic stewardship and how it interacts with antimicrobial stewardship. So diagnostic stewardship is ensuring that we have the right patient, right test at the right time where versus antimicrobial stewardship, which would be the right drug dose and duration. But really they come together, particularly when we're looking at new technologies such as these molecular diagnostics. Um, so I was just gonna share one quick slide. I'll see if I can get it to go of how we can value um, diagnostic stewardship in the nursing home setting. Um, <clears throat> so diagnostic stewardship is divided into three phases. You have the pre-analytic phase, which is everything up to ordering the test, which is really what we'll focus on for the post-acute long-term care setting. The analytic phase, which is everything that goes on in processing the sample. And the post-analytic phase, which is your retrospective tracking and then reporting that data out. So I wanted to focus on the pre-analytic phase when it comes to these newer diagnostics. And the biggest thing is evaluating those local urinary symptoms. Um, so in particular, as our other two great speakers mentioned, these tests are even more sensitive than our traditional urine culture. So making sure you have those local urinary symptoms to increase your pre-test probability of getting a positive result. Setting up algorithms or treatment guidelines, I think that's especially important with any newer technology, ensuring that it's understood how to order the test, what the sample collection looks like, and then how to interpret those results. If you're able to, having clinical decision support, such as comments or questions in your electronic health record. One of the things that we like in stewardship is requiring an indication for antibiotics. In this case, for diagnostic stewardship, it could be requiring the symptoms that led to the order. So rather than non-specific behavioral change, was it urinary frequency, pain, anything like that, that led to the order of the urinary diagnostic? And then finally, proper sample collection um, and taking it to the lab. So I'll stop there, but I'm happy to answer any questions. We also have some resources I think we're gonna send out afterwards. Thanks. What what do you think about um, Travis's question? With the PCR report results, is it possible that it could suggest antibiotics based on the genotype that the organism is actually resistant to? Mm 
It's a great question. I think what's difficult to answer about that question is that these PCR tests are not FDA approved and therefore their reports are also not FDA approved. So it's unclear how the genotype results actually line up with the susceptibilities that we're used to seeing. Um, so I would say it's potentially possible. I think we just, I think what would be helpful is if we could get some standardization to things like the question about ampl amplification. So what does the copies mean compared to what we're used to with things like colony counts? And then also um, the, looking at things like what genes were tested and what do those results look like? I would add, just add to Singh uh, for that question. You know, we don't know what all of the genes are that make a particular organism resistant to an antibiotic. We know some of them that we can identify with the sequencing, but they're certainly, you're absolutely right. There certainly may be genes in an organism that could make them resistant to an antibiotic that we can't, that we don't know yet. And therefore we can't identify it with sequencing or PCR, but we would see it with typical susceptibility testing where we put that antibiotic on an, a plate growing that organism. And so that's where the link is, the, the correlation between those two is unclear. A uh, question for all of you, and, and I would also include Chris Chai and Joe Tansy with this. We already struggle with people that inappropriately order UAs, you know, sort of a shotgun approach to patient is acting funny, whatever it is. Um, in providers struggle, once you get that culture back and it shows more than a hundred thousand something, people just feel compelled to, well, I need to treat this without recognizing it's probably asymptomatic bacteria. So now if we enter a new technology, that's even more likely to give us, there's, there's an, I mean, there's a, a bacteria, we identified it, we got to kill it. Um, I just see us going backwards in antibiotic stewardship and losing ground that it's taken 15 years to gain. Um, so Lauren, Chris, Joe, your thoughts on that? If you start seeing lots and lots more UTIs diagnosed based on PCR tests? I think the concern is valid because as you mentioned, asymptomatic bacteria already drives over prescribing. And then if this test comes back, I mean, we've seen these results of four organisms and someone else mentioned in the chat, the broad antibiotic recommendations that are provided. So I think when you're evaluating, if, if we're seeing, you know, this technology more and more and you're evaluating those results, making sure that you're still looking at those results to see if they make sense. Does Staph aureus make sense in this urine? Um, do I need to cover for that? Or what should prompt me to retest this resident if I still have a high suspicion for UTI in order to not overprescribe unnecessarily? And I'll let Chris um, answer as well. Hey, I just wanted to say that was an excellent group of presentations. And my main question is, is Dr. Gum, what would be helpful from public health? You know, <clears throat> we can't provide the clinical data, the standardization and everything that Dr. Fitzpatrick was talking about, but we can provide messaging. And I, and if that would be helpful to message to providers more about the use of these tests, we could think about doing that. We kind of walk a line as public health practitioners about trying to stay away from clinical decision-making because that's your area. But if there are uh, <clears throat> public health implications of over-treating um, based on these tests or reading these reports that say you should cover for MRSA, Pseudomonas, and E. coli, as well as all these other commensals. I think we, I saw some nice examples in the handouts that, you know, we could take a look at. The other part that concerns me is it sounds like what Dr. Pallet was saying was that you order a urine culture and you get a PCR and there's limited options, you know, now for culture. So I'm not sure what we can do as a communicable disease program. I don't know if Joe Tansy, if she's on, has any thoughts about um, what what could be done from a health facilities point of view, but that seems like to be an issue too. If it's if it's a cost and resource availability thing, that then is leading to misleading, and that's just something we need to kind of think about. What it comes down to is is like there's a lot of clinical decision making around UTIs, even when you order a urine culture, which which makes it you know harder than other things, and we recognize that. Yeah, I recognize that. I want Joe to weigh in, but I would also say I've been called 20 or 30 times already by providers saying they're not going to approve urine PCR. And now if that's the only thing the lab does, I don't know where they go with that. 
Yeah, I, I guess I just wanted to say from a from our regulatory perspective, we certainly um as you know, uh really support the um the reduction in use of uh antibiotics and and have been very comfortable with what we've been doing as far as testing for UTIs and and how that um how you are prescribing those and looking at those. So we would not want to see a, an increase use in, in antibiotics, and that certainly goes against any regulations that we have that antibiotic use increase. You know, we are looking at the, the decrease of appropriate diagnosis and, and uh, decrease in use of those. So uh, whatever we can do as well in supporting... Um, not changing what the current practice is until certainly there is more evidence that shows this is where we need to be going. Uh, we would support the, that and um, and that would be the message we would send out to our nursing home providers for sure. Yeah. Other questions? By the way, this was a wonderful presentation, guys. We really appreciate it. And Monica Bailey put in the chat box, uh, Monica's working on her DNP, is that she's seen lab requisition sheets that don't even have the option for urine culture, only urine PCR. We are seeing that the physician order, NPPA has an order for culture, oftentimes just returning a PCR. Um, it does seem to go against the duties of the lab to carry out orders from the medical team. Well, especially if it's not approved. Hey, Singh, this is Christine Loreca. I I'm going to recirculate that suspected UTI tool in case that's helpful. That was co-branded by uh, CDPHE, Intelligent, and CHCA and uh, CHA. Um, I I know Dr. Eber has still found it very helpful because it it strikes me that some of these problems could be alleviated if um you know we're only sending a urine when we should be sending a urine <laughs> because then. Yeah then you have to deal with the results, right? Yeah. Right. That would address, yeah, Katie Arthur has that comment in the chat box. It's like, yeah, if you get a test and it's positive, everyone's asking, why aren't you treating that positive test? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I usually tell people, just tell them, oh, they've got asymptomatic bacteriuria. That is their diagnosis. And we treat that with water. And that's the same thing with the urine culture too, right? I mean, you get a urine culture that grows E. coli, Candida, and Propionibacterium. You're probably going to look at the E. coli and <clears throat> not treat the others. You're still going to have to do that with the PCR. I think the part of the problem is in the way these are reported and how black and white it seems when you read the report. Um, and then I do think we need some guidance around how to interpret and interpret those results over time that are correlated to clinical activity. The other thing that we have is lots and lots of data on treatment of UTIs um, in clinical trials where the treatment regimens that are recommended actually work. Um, they're not failing because we're not detecting all these other organisms. So I think that there's that piece of data as well. Yeah, that's great, Chris. I know we're a little over. The only other thing I was going to mention is that one thing I'm looking forward to is hopefully hearing more from our federal bodies about this, these diagnostics. Um, in the most recent IDSA diabetic foot infections guidelines, they have a strong recommendation to use culture rather than PCR. So I'd be curious to see if we can, for the same reasons that were brought up today. So I'll be curious to see if that gets um, applied to other uh, conditions as well. Okay. Well, we're five minutes over. I appreciate people staying on in a, and certainly everybody knows how to get in touch with Singh or myself. Um, if there are other questions, things that come up, uh, we can certainly keep the dialogue going, but uh, thank you everybody for being on. Thank you. Thanks.